Thank you for your patience. Everybody, we're going to get started in a few minutes. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to get us started with um, just a, a brief hello, and then uh, people will continue to come in as we get started. So uh, my name is Sherry Stella, and I'm the Director of Pastoral Ministries at St. Joan of Arc. And I want to thank you for being with us tonight on our presentation on ang parenting your anxious, depressed kids in a COVID world. You know, as a parent of five, I know firsthand how difficult and challenging these times have been. So I'm really grateful that Michael and Callie have agreed to lead us through a four-part series dedicated to helping parents navigate their way through these chaotic and unpredictable times. Um, and if you could take anything away from me personally, I just hope it is this, that you are not alone. Even when you feel like it, you are not alone. You have a community of faith here to support you and walk with you in your struggles. So um, just always hold that close to your heart. And before I turn it over to Michael and Callie, I'd like, you, like to lead us in a short prayer. So if you could just maybe close your eyes, take a deep breath, and keep your eyes closed and just reflect on the words that I, I pray with you tonight. Loving God, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support. As we begin our time together, help us to engage in meaningful discussions, allow us to grow closer as a group, and help us to nurture the bonds of community. Fill us with the power of your inspiration, love, and grace as we learn new ways to help and support those in our care. We ask you that you grant us the courage and the strength that we need to persevere during these difficult and challenging times. In your name, we pray. Amen. Well, Michael and Callie, I'm going to turn it over to you. So thank you for being here. Sherry, sure, thank you. Callie, do you want to start? Sure. Well, I think we just want to be able to welcome everybody in. We're Michael and I are a part of the Traverse Counseling and Consulting team, and um, I know for myself, I'm just so honored to, to be here with you guys tonight, um, talking about kids and parenting, especially in a COVID world, is um, something that just brings me a lot of joy to really join alongside families and parents specifically as they're trying to navigate this world and also how to support their kids through this too. So. I'm really grateful to be here with you guys, um, and Michael is along here with me too. Yeah, good to be with you. Uh, again, I'm Michael Broviak. I'm an independent clinical social worker and um, uh, been in practice for a long time, uh, one of the co-owners here at Traverse. Um, and again, just happy to be on this journey with you. I come to you today as a, a humble parent who have uh, two teenage boys that are 14 and 16 that um, uh, you know, if you have kids and you know that uh, you're, you're trying to figure this out as well as we go. Um, so I can talk about uh, COVID fatigue and how I see that in my own family. Um, but more importantly, we're here to talk a bit about how, to, how do we manage when there is anxiousness and depression, um, particularly that can be amplified by the, the, uh, the COVID world that we're in, uh, among other things. So Again, we're just grateful to be here with you. 
Um, a couple of housekeeping things. We do ask that you uh, keep your uh, microphones uh, muted. Um, we do have the chat function available. And so as we move forward today, um, you certainly may uh, choose to uh, provide comments. And in fact, there are windows of time where we do wanna ask you and we're gonna ask you to use the, the chat function um, and so that you can type that out for us. It also protects your anonymity. So when you're using the chat function, um, uh, we can then uh, report back to you what we're hearing. Um, and so what we want to be able to do is um, record this. So we are recording this now. And so this will be a, a program that can be downloadable for folks if they want to watch it. So um, without further ado, let's, uh, let's move forward. Shall we? So to start off, we just have a few outcomes that we want to, want to be able to provide for you guys and, and really three points that we want you guys to be able to walk away with today. Uh, so first, to have you guys gain understanding and what is happening with mental health disorders during COVID, especially for our kids. To learn how to manage your own personal anxiety and all the, the stuff that we're trying to manage parents during this time and how to lead your kids through their own anxiety and their own mental health issues. And then understanding strategies of how to support our kids through their mental health journeys. What are some strategic ways that we can take away from today too? One of the, the things that uh, for Callie and I, and again, I think we're biased because we're mental health practitioners, um, uh, is that it's important that when we look at the crises that our, our community is dealing with, with this virus, um, with all the other things that have happened over the last 12 months, um, it is our stance that we believe that we should be prioritizing mental health over academics. Um, we believe that, that academics are something that is recoverable over time. Um, however, mental health um, may not be. And so we really are wanting to take an emphasis that we believe that the mental health of our kids and of ourselves is really important. And so, um, you know, we're just sort of tipping our hand and our value here about this and how important this is. Um, another little sidebar is uh, for Kelly and I, one of the strengths that we bring to you today is that we treat people individually and uh, importantly, we work with families and whole families. We believe that families are the core of our society and that we have to do whatever we can to help families to strengthen how they work together and overcome the obstacles that they face. So um, again, we wanted to just uh, bring this bias to you, which I think is an important one. Well, to start off with, we would just wanna talk about the challenges that our kids have faced this past year. Um, our kids have transitioned drastically into distance learning. They're learning how to self-teach themselves. They have less or infrequent, inconsistent contact with teachers. Some kids might be doing a hybrid mode, so they might have some in-person time, but then that gets chopped up with some of those online virtual days too. That inconsistency can be really tough for our kids to be able to manage. And there's a distraction and distress of being on a device all day long, looking at their screens and having those the bright light shining at them all day. Um, there's social isolation this past year. We have less interactions in the real. Our kids are distancing from others and our kids need social, physical interaction with others. That's one of the key developmental pieces for our kids and to keep them safe in, so, in many families, um, there's been more distancing, more isolation. And part of that too is the less contact with their schoolmates too. In addition, uh, our kids have had great impacts on their activities. Activities have either been canceled or shortened, or it's just all around different sports seasons this year, other activities, whether it's you know, fully masked or not being able to have the full crowds at the events, practices look different or entirely canceled. And with that, there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of grief and loss for our kids too. Their normalcy during the school year has completely changed and is completely different from what they're used to. And the structure that they've been able to really um, rely on has been really different. It's been uprooted for them this past year. And so it's been really normal for our kids to grieve those changes and the losses of those special routines and events. 
my uh, my children, uh, my boys are cross country skiers. We're on the Nordic ski team, and I have to tell you that it was it was so hard for them in the winter when it came because it was delayed. Now they're out now, and so it's going well. But the biggest piece they talked about is, Dad, this sucks. I I can't be with my friends. That was more important to them than the competition or the the activity itself. But to be with their friends was absolutely critical for them. So that's been a very hard thing for them. And I suspect for many others. Yeah. I think one of the messages that I hear the most from a lot of the kids that I work with is I actually want to go back to school because I miss being with my friends. And there's like shock. Like I can't imagine I'd ever actually say that I actually want to go back to school. But man, I just want to be in person with my friends, with my classmates and my teacher. So um, so question for you all, we want to encourage you guys to use that chat feature to, to Michael or myself. Um, how have you seen COVID, COVID impact your own kids? What have you seen there be struggles? Maybe there's been some positives that you've seen for your kids, but where, where has that impact been for your family? So I want to give you guys a second or two here to, to respond if you wish. Well, people are thinking, um, I, I can share with you that um, I have experienced more irritability with mm. my kids, um, mm -hmm. um, agitated, frustrated, um, impatient at times. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's certainly been one thing that I've seen in my household. Um, and it's interesting when they've been able to be out social with the social distancing, I see it reduced. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's been really hard in the winter, having that those opportunities for social distancing outside. I, I see a lot of COVID fatigue, especially with the winter. Um, here's a message. My teen is falling behind in school because she is lonely. I started mm -hmm. a new job and she is home all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so this is, this is uh, a struggle, you bet. Um, adjusted well to distance learning, but increased irritability and anxiety has definitely increased. You bet. Mm -hmm. Children stay up all night and sleep all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been really hard to regulate scheduling and how to structure routines for the day. Children's sleep patterns are way off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for, for my kids, it's been um, painful because they, they have very close friends, but they live out past Hutchinson. And uh, mm -hmm. I've had to stop them from being able to go spend time with them and to go to that house and be with them. Um, so it's been really hard for them. Um, it, they, that's a grieving that I think that they've had with this. Mm -hmm. they can't be with these close friends that they just so enjoy being with. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I can imagine that grieving is really unfamiliar for your kids too. It's a different way to feel that kind of loss. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point, Kelly, that they, um, they're they needing help to know how to put language to it. Um, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they don't know how to put language to it. That's the point. So we have to help them. Yeah. With Here's another one. A lack of external structure um, and schedule leaves them drifting. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. One of the hardest things kids have, and it's a life task, is to, to learn how can I put my own structure on myself? How can I manage my own schedule? Um, and and uh, it's very difficult for, for kids to do that on their own. Mm -hmm. um, higher, go ahead, Callie. Higher anxiety and frustration because other kids are not following the rules. I've seen that a lot. It's really hard when um, families are choosing to operate and, and support their family differently during this time too. And it can feel really hard for our kids to have that understanding of, you know, why are, why are we doing it differently? Why are my friends able to have a lot of sleepovers or get to do X, Y, and Z? It can be really frustrating. I see a lot of that anxious and depressive symptomology can, can really stem from that too. Yeah, another great comment. How do I reinforce the rules during COVID? Uh, right, my kids want to hang out and um, 
uh, there can be a defiance. Um, I don't want to have to mask up. I don't want to social distance. Um, yeah. That is very difficult um, mm -hmm. to, to help them understand why this is important. Um, especially in the first uh, four months, that's shifted some um, just because of the just the ongoing tragedy of losses. Some kids have, have been able to see why this is such a big deal and some still are struggling. Um, I'm gonna keep moving. If people have more comments, uh, we, we can bring those up. Um, um, there's another one. Assignments are due at 11.59 PM daily. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it reinforces staying up late, doesn't it? Yeah. That, that may be feedback for instructors at school. Uh, mm -hmm. say, you guys, this is brutal to make yeah. it at midnight like that. Um, yeah, not helpful necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanna walk you into a little bit of uh, some of the trends that we see around depression, anxiety, and behavior disorders. Um, so these are some national stats. Um, and, and these are some stats through, I believe, uh, 2017. So these are pre-COVID numbers. And so these are just sort of the prevalence of, of depression, anxiety, uh, and behavior disorders. And so the, the things that I want you to see is that um, with depression, uh, we certainly see it, that start to crank up to about 6%, uh, particularly when children are age 12 to 17. Um, and in some ways that makes sense that some of the formative years and kids can sometimes struggle at that point in time. Um, when we look at anxiety, we, compared to depression, we are seeing more anxiety, particularly in that 12 to 17 uh, age bracket, um, you know, upwards of, of 10, 11 um, percent of, of young people reporting uh, that anxiety. And then certainly behavior disorders, these are children that are having uh, more impulse control types of struggles. Um, and we see that uh, usually show up more in the early elementary, um, six to 11. Um, and then typically we start to see a reduction, um, typically because kids are getting help and support are we, the reason why we see that drop down from that 12 to seven, uh, 12 uh, to 17 years old um, age bracket. Um, so these are just some interesting trends that we see um, as far as age goes. Um, it's important to note that we do say anxiety in children age three to five. Um, uh, so just take note of that. So we wanted to provide you guys with a little bit of stats of just what we do know so far of how the COVID-19 lockdown has impacted our kids' mental health. Now, we're only you know, barely a month into 2021. So some of these stats are pretty fresh and that might change over time too, but some of these I found uh, pretty important to take a look at. So 85.7% of parents are reporting noticeable changes in their kids' emotions and behaviors. And it kind of reduces into that too, difficulty concentrating, boredom, irritability, restlessness, nervousness, loneliness, uneasiness, and worries. Very significant numbers of percentages there for kids that are experiencing these changes in their emotions and behaviors. Um, wanted to throw in college kids too in here. Seventy-one percent have an increase in stress and anxiety. Eighty-nine percent reporting a difficulty in concentrating, disruption in sleep patterns, report concerns in academic performance. I think a lot of those numbers might be pretty similar with our school-aged kids too. Um, and parents, 75% are reporting feeling stressed given the quarantine situation. And that's additionally associated directly with their kids' emotional and behavioral changes. Um, I wanted to put in a piece about suicidality. Now, some of these stats are from 2019. We don't have uh, fully formed stats yet for 2020, but in 2019, suicide was the leading cause of death for people aged 15 to 24. And in that year, we had 47,500 deaths by suicide. And nearly 6,000 of those were for, from kids ages 15 to 24. Um, and as far as suicide attempts, we had almost 1.2 million suicide attempts, which translates to one attempt every 26.6 seconds. 
although we don't have specific statistics quite yet of what suicidality and ideation has looked like for 2020, I think what we're understanding and what we're hearing right now is that some of that has been increased for our kids in this last year too. I would add that we're seeing that on an international level as well. <laughs> Watching the news media, um, it, it's happening across the globe. Mm -hmm. Which is why it's important that we're all here to, to be able to talk about mental health for our kids. Um, th this is an interesting graph. Um, what this is, is, is really looking at um, the per, uh, percent of 9th through 12th graders who have at least one indicator of suicidality, it could be ideation or thoughts about it. I want to be careful here, this doesn't correlate directly with suicide attempts, but these are risk factors for suicide. As we see an increase in the number of hours on electronic devices, we see the increase of percent of students having at least one suicide risk factor. So um, what does this mean? Well, we put this in here because the, the rules of engagement with the electronic devices has completely been thrown out the window with COVID. And so this requires, I think, for us as families to have a greater awareness of how our kids are engaging with electronic devices and how do we monitor that is something we wanna be able to talk to you more about um, a little bit today, but certainly in our last presentation, it is about technology. How do we, how do we manage this with our kids given this new set of rules? Um, Pre-COVID, I was following the, the pediatrician's guidelines of two screen time hours uh, a day and um, that rapidly went out the window as, as our kids have had to transition to, to the online learning. Um, and the, the reality of, of our kids needing to use uh, uh, devices to connect socially. So um, I get this piece and, it, and the, the risk factor may still be present. It's something we have to watch for. Um, and we don't have the new data yet on this, but this is something we certainly have to keep an eye on with this. Um, here's the other part that I just want to share with you. This is again, pre-COVID, um, we are seeing depression and anxiety have increased over time. Um, so this is, is, is jumping up. Um, and this is again, a growing concern, uh, that we're seeing on a societal level. Is it possible that this may be related to the increase of screen and screen access? Yeah, that certainly is a factor that can be uh, noteworthy that we still need to learn more about. Um, so uh, again, it's as this growing concern happens, we have to be more vigilant with our children um, to make sure we're aware how they're doing. Um, uh, increased uh, depression and anxiety um, would argue is also happening on a societal level with adults. So it's mm -hmm. not just children, we're seeing anxiety increase. Um, with, with the adult population as well. The other thing is that we have to keep in mind that if you have one struggle, you may have two. So it is common for us in our practice that when we work with someone that may have depression, it is possible that they also may have anxiety. And in fact, one may feed the other. Uh, so we are seeing the possibility um, upwards of 30 to 50 percent um, uh, may have an additional struggle that they're having beyond just the anxiety or depression they're having or, or having a behavior struggle. So again, these are something to be aware of that when we're treating individuals that may be struggling, it's important that we, we identify how they may be struggling together uh, with more than one, one uh, mental health uh, challenge. Um, so when you, you guys look at this stuff, I, I wanna be careful here. We're just trying to be honest with you about this. What I also wanna have you be aware of is that, that there, these things are readily treatable. Mm -hmm. There are ways to help children who are struggling with anxiety or depression or behavior challenges. So that's the good news and that's where the hope is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's still many children who are not getting help. Um, but if you look at the numbers, uh, you know, 78% of children uh, uh, with depression receive treatment. 
uh, 60% of children with anxiety receive treatment, it's not enough, right? We still have more work to do to make sure people are accessing help for our kids. This is where the sort of silent suffering can happen with our kids. And, and this is where um, we're just grateful you're all on this training because if we can help you detect something where your ch child may be struggling and we can help you figure out what to do, um, that's a good thing. So certainly something we're really committed to. Um, again, there, there um, is a way out of this. The treatment modality has had to change because of COVID. So typically uh, we're seeing providers move to a teletherapy format. Interestingly, many children are responding very positively to this. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know, Cal, if you want to comment about that, what, what you've seen with some of the children you've uh, done. Um, so I, I end up seeing, I have a lot of kids on my caseload and, and adolescents. There's, um, you know, in some way, there's a familiarity with technology use for our kids. They're much more accustomed to FaceTiming and Snapchatting their friends that having a, a telehealth call with their therapist, too, there can be some familiarity as well. Um, you know, for kids when they're, you know, logging into a telehealth session with me at home, it also invites me a little bit more into their, their safe space at home too, and can actually kind of provide kind of a different level of that therapeutic intimacy and that relationship building too. Um, so in some ways, the, the telehealth model can actually be, has been fairly helpful for some of these kids too. Where it gets a little trickier is if we have families that are needing uh, help beyond an individual or they need some more family support, mm -hmm. uh, Zoom structure meetings can work. They require a different kind of structure, a way to manage it, um, but it can be done. So certainly hope and good news for families needing help. So let's talk a little bit about the anxious brain. Um, anxiety actually de is developed out of a normal brain response to fear. So in some ways, anxiety can be helpful. Make sure a semi moves into your lane. There's that jolt of fear that tells you to get your car out of the way. Anxiety can be learned. I grew up in a family of origin that um, my dad was really angry and abusive in ways that my brain learned to avoid dad as a protective mechanism. Um, anxiety can also be systems-based. What we've seen over the last decade an increase of uh, school shootings. So systemically, we've also learned of how to respond to that fear. So in a way, it's baseline anxiety can fairly be a normal response. And a lot of times for our kids and, and for us as adults too, who experience anxiety, it, it becomes really overwhelming. and starts to respond to things that might not be a typical normal brain response. So the anxious brain can impact the whole person. It's not just impacting our mental health and how we're thinking. Um, you can see it in your whole body. You notice kids get really tired or even the opposite. They get really restless and fidgety, start sweating. Kids might have uh, racing heart rates. You might see them kind of fidgeting with their fingers a lot, tapping on everything. Um, it can also impact behaviorally. Some kids get very hypervigilant. They're on edge, keyed up, really ready and alert to jump. Or it could be a lot of irritability. Cognitively, it can impact us. Uh, we see that with racing thoughts or unwanted thoughts. Sometimes kids struggle to control some of their worries or have worries and fears that are really undesirable and can be really fearful for them to have too. We also see our kids have a wide range of emotions. It's either this big roller coaster of happy and sad and mad and kind of all over the place and you feel a little dizzy trying to follow them. Or sometimes they, they can appear very flat line, very flat affect, not really feeling a lot of those emotions or expressing them. Also common is that excessive worry, fear, feeling of impending doom. Sometimes you might hear your kids talk about, um, you know, I don't want to go there. I just feel like something bad is going to happen. I don't know what it is. I just feel like something bad is going to happen. Kids can have a lot of trouble sleeping, feel really nauseous, 
um, you'll see kids, a lot of times with younger kids too, they'll, they'll complain of a lot of stomach aches or headaches. And that could be a, a physical response to their anxiety too. Um, poor concentration, trembling, all just different things to kind of keep an eye out on. So what can anxiety look like? It can look like a lot of things. Um, look like refusal, that oppositional behavior. I won't do that. I'm not gonna log on to school today. Um, I won't do this. It's a fight response. You feel like you're fighting with your kid here when you feel this way. It's inability, I can't do it. You can see this kind of freeze response that almost like kind of a fear in their eye too. Like, mom, I, I just really can't do it. They might create problems or acting out, might use humor, kind of this flea flight, flea and fight uh, mode here. There might be some nonverbal signs of anxiousness too, really clenching their jaws, furrowing their brows, tight hands. Notice their breathing becomes really shallow or rapid. We can also see it in relational struggles too. They're struggling to make contact with their friends or peers. You're noticing that they're getting into a lot of fights with their friends. They're isolating or withdrawing from their friends. Comes out in the sibling relationships, parent-child conflict too, even some parent-to-parent -parent conflict when you, know, you and your co-parent aren't aligning on, on how to help support your kiddo. There might be some other kind of anxiety happening in the house too. I think it's important for parents to be able to see these behaviors and understand how it functions out of the anxiety. A lot of times we see these behaviors and there's a purpose behind it too. Um, generally speaking, I don't think many kids are just refusing to do things just for the heck of it. There's generally it's something happening for them underneath it. And it's so important for parents to be able to see that and really understand what's underneath it and really attune into their kids' needs in that as well. We'll talk about attunement a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but I think this is such an essential piece for that parent-child relationship. You know, if we looked at it at a grander scale, if you look at our whole country um, this last 12 months, um, mm -hmm. if we looked at these things, you probably could say a lot of the adults have had this too. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. You know, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I, after the inauguration, I, I stopped watching the media so much. Every morning I'd be on trying to figure out what's going on, what's next. And I, for me, just the, the, you know, some settling here, I found that I you know, eased up. It, it was a reflective moment for me to realize that there was a collective anxiousness I was having, just trying to figure out, are we going to be okay, mm -hmm. given what's going on in our country and our world? So um, it's interesting how powerful uh, this is and how we can be affected um, by what's going on around us. Uh, depression. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, uh, depression can include sadness, fatigue, hopelessness, and shame. Um, the shame piece is important because kids that are depressed, they certainly don't want to be depressed and they struggle so hard and then they feel bad because I can't function. I can't get out of this. Um, and so they, they struggle, um, and certainly can be part of life as we try to navigate changes. Um, it really is important for us to take note uh, that it does look and can be different than grief and loss. Grief and loss is really something we see on a shorter term basis. And the depression is something that can lock in and, and last much longer. Um, so we have to keep an eye on that. Um, how does this look? Um, it does impact the whole group. Hey, yeah. Can I pause you? Because we have a really great, a great comment in here. Sure. Could you provide some helpful phrases that aren't shaming? Or like, how, how can parents support their kids if they're noticing some sort of depressive symptoms in a way that isn't shaming? Yeah, great. Uh, uh, one thing that I think helps, uh, uh, you could talk about, it looks like you're stuck. It looks like you're in a hard spot. And, and the other thing that I would encourage parents is that um, using language of how, how can you be with them? You know, let's work together. Let's figure out what we can do to get unstuck. Um, the, the other thing I'd have you take note of, um, this is important because I see this with, with uh, boys or young men when we see depression. Um, the, the depression can take the form of what we would call a, a vegetative effect. 
And Thank these you. are our kids that, that um, can do the work and can do it well, but but it'll be at the table, right? They're at their desk and they have the, the, de the, the book open. They're trying to work, but they can't get the momentum going. Mm -hmm. Okay, this that is a classic sign of sort of that vegetative depression. I can't get going. I'm stuck. Um, I want to do this so badly and I feel bad that I can't do it. And then um, we see kids um, seek relief, okay? And that's where they're going on to the internet. Um, they're texting their friends, they're, they're, they're camping out on YouTube. Um, and then before they realize that two hours is gone and it's time to go to bed and they feel bad because they weren't able to get it going. So mm -hmm. this is the, the stuck cycle that you can see kids in. Um, and it, it, uh, so helping them with that stuck language, looks like you're having a hard time. Huh, what do you think is happening? Mm -hmm. What do you think we could do to, to try to help figure this out? Most, well, I would argue every child wants to succeed. And I'll be honest with you, they're doing the best they can. Um, uh, so the, the struggle is that they're, um, they look unmotivated. They look irritable. Um, and they can have a defiance with them. And so what we wanna help parents do, to do is to shift from trying to fight them to see, can we shift this to join them and work together? It's so hard to be in conflict with each other. Um, so there can be this, uh, you know, flatlining, you can get no affect with depression as well. Um, and you can have you know, excessive um, um, sadness that may show up. Um, uh, sleep would be a key factor that I'd have you take a look at. And it's really hard, you guys, because sleep is, is out of whack for many kids. We've already commented on this. The technology does affect sleep. Um, so uh, we're trying to see when is the sleep way out of whack and way out of the norm. Can mm -hmm. they function and can they do or participate in their classroom work if there is a Zoom class? Um, and if they're not, then, then we want to be mindful of that, that they're really stuck. Um, so we talked a little bit about the refusal, um, uh, the, the can't, the freeze response, mm -hmm. tearfulness, sleep, trying to get out, I'm trying to exit, um, low self-esteem, self-doubt, self-harm can be an element here. And certainly suicidality. Um, and does need to be taken very seriously um, in relationship struggles. I wanna just pause for a moment. If you look at these symptoms, and if I could go back a few slides, I don't know if anybody saw anything similar with the anxiety symptoms or what they look like. Um, I would Pretty similar. Uh, yeah, so this is where it can be challenging when we try to assess for kids. Um, there are sometimes that it's both depression and anxiety. And so these are the, the cases where we typically are prioritizing which one seems more prevalent. And we have to acknowledge that there's both. There's an anxiousness and a depression. So an anxiousness, I can't, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. I get anxious about an assignment that's due, but then I'm sad and depressed because I can't get going. So it's a very uh, uh, strugglesome cycle that children can find themselves in. Um, and they need our help to help them see a path out. And that's where I think um, uh, another language for parents, if you're talking about stuck, um, you can also use the power of vision to help with children. You can say, you know, I know we're stuck. You know, remember that language, we're stuck. And I know we'll find a way out of this. Mm -hmm. So there's a hopefulness, right? That's an important piece. I, I appreciate the language about the we for kids to hear that their parents are in it with them mm -hmm. is is really life changing for a lot of kids. There can be um, the sense of shame or feeling like they're the problem in the family. And I, a lot of times I have kids coming into my office feeling like they're a burden to their family. And when kids are able to see that their parents are in it with them and they're gonna be that support system alongside them to figure out how to do this differently and how to feel differently, it makes just such a world of a difference for kids to, to have some progress too. 
Um, so we're gonna ask for some comments again from you guys in a different sense. How are you guys as parents managing COVID? Individually as your own self, as a parent, how are you guys doing this past year? We'll take a couple minutes for you guys. I think I already shared a little bit. Definitely uh, am aware of the anxiety that showed up this last year. Um, that that was affecting me and more vigilant. Um, yeah. um, kind of was on my kids about masking. Um, uh, they'd give me a hard time, you know, <clears throat> but I would emphasize how important that is. I, I had to repeat that over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard, I think, especially at the beginning of the pandemic to figure out where where is the structure for safety for my kids? How do we want to root as a family into how we're going to navigate this? And I know at the beginning, I heard a lot from parents of just this uncertainty of what do I do? How do I do this? So lots of questions here. Uh, parents feeling like a failure. Absolutely. I, I can't, I'm struggling just to get through this myself and, and how do I do that with my kids and help them through? Um, and then certainly concerns about what do we do about kids with cutting and self-harm? Um, just to, to, to jump on that real quickly, that that is something that you need to move on with immediacy and take that part very, very serious. Um, and that would be, a, if you want, we can talk about that later on, um, so immediacy with that is getting to a pediatrician is the fastest route. Um, another comment, struggling, we are all at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're all, we're all home all the time and yet feel disconnected from each other. We're all trying to carve out our own private time and space. Yeah, it's hard to be able to have some of that alone time for yourself and take care of your individual needs while also fostering your relationships when you're kind of physically on top of each other all the time in the house too. The, the disconnected is an important piece. That, that's a common thing that I am seeing when I've done you know, family therapy meetings. They're, yeah, we're all in the same house, but we're, we're not connected. We're not taking time to be, they, they, the family meal or something like that is um, um, gone, right? Or have had to recreate new ways of connecting. Um, yeah, the last thing the kids want to do is any more family and together time. Yes. And then difficulty balancing, uh, supporting all the needs of my kids and my own and my work. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm not doing anything well. Well, I, I think for us, we'd say, uh, if we go back to mental health, if we can stay, state that with a priority. Um, I've told many families, it's like, you know what? I, if our kids can get through this with their mental health fairly intact mm -hmm. by the end of this virus, and that's probably nine, 10 months from now, I don't know, that, then we've done a good job. They've survived an extraordinary life event. Good comments, you guys. Thank you for sharing all those things. So we want to take a little bit of time about talking about parents caring for themselves. So two reasons to relax. You can't help others if you're incapacitated. Excuse me for a second. Um, so I'm sure most of you've probably been on an airplane, had the oxygen mask rule to put the mask on yourself before putting it on somebody else. Um, it's important that we're taking care of ourselves and making sure that our mental health needs are cared for and intact. Because when we're, when we're cared for, we show up as better humans, as better parents for our kids too. And our kids mirror us. Um, I really, I really like this picture here. This baby is newborn is mimicking father's facial expression. So even at a young age, it's innate for our kids to mirror what we're doing. Um, 
I'm sure we've heard our kids like repeat sentences that we've said for better or worse. We see little quirks of our kids that, you know, look and sound like us too. Um, so it's important to also be able to show that for our kids of how to take care of ourselves, how to prioritize our mental health needs, primarily so that they learn how to do it for themselves. Um, but then also that we're, we're in a better place to, be able to care for them too. I went in, I went a little, a little heavy with the airplane and oxygen roll at the other slide, but um, kids impacted by mental health can be challenging for parents. It is really hard to parent your kids in general and then to have these mental health concerns on top of it. It is really, really challenging. And I, I just really want to normalize that. It is really, really hard. And our kids in these times of distress can trigger our own stuff. And it requires us to have more strength and resources to care for them in those moments. And so it's important that we have our full capacity and our needs taken care of first so that we can fully care for their needs. So when we're finding ourselves triggered by our kids' behavior, that's an invitation to reflect on some things. So I like that change of, of kind of word right there. It's an invitation for us to have some internal reflection. Mm. Am I taking good care of myself, my home life, my partnership? How's my sleep? What does my diet and exercise look like? Is my time expended matching my values? What I really care about in my life? Am I, am I living through that too? Do I need to do some deeper work around why this specific behavior is really triggering for me? And do I need additional help? Do I need to seek counsel at my church or, or through a mental health counselor to make sure that I'm really taking care of all of these buttons so that I can really care for my kid too? Um, you know, one thing that we like to talk about at Traverse is proactive versus reactive parenting. To be parental leaders, we need to be one step ahead of the game. Uh, when we react to our kids' behaviors, a lot of times, um, there, it might not be the most helpful response. If we can stay one step ahead and know how to care and how to respond for those, those distressing needs, we can really help our kids learn how to do it for themselves too. Um, I would just want to jump on this. This is, this is one of the hardest things in the world. If you look at mm -hmm. uh, the volatility, the unpredictable things that have happened in our world in the last 12 months, uh, to, to, for me, proactive, is, is that's if that's the goal i gotta tell you there i'll just be humble there are days that i feel like i'm barely one step ahead of how to manage what's going on mm -hmm. so so this is our work right we're trying to figure out okay what do i do what's shifted what's changed how do i need to respond and then how do i deploy it and it's 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 exhausting work folks this is uh um some of the hardest parenting that's been induced by by a worldwide events mm -hmm. um yeah, it's just extraordinary. Um, yeah, I think I think this past year and everything that we've experienced, it's it's difficult to be kind of in step with your kids, let alone mm -hmm. one step ahead too. So we know anxiety fuels conflict in relationships. Okay, and and we're again, if you think about anxiety, I'm in a fight or flight mode. I can easily get into an agitation or conflict. What I want you to know is one of the quickest interventions that you can use as a family to try to gain that leadership piece is consider how you wanna implement structure. Now structure can mean lots of different things. It can be a routine that we're gonna set as a family. Um, this is hard because I don't know how many of you have tried to do the regular family walks. Um, I did, I was able to do it for a block of time. And I gotta tell you, my kids fought me at the end there. I don't wanna do that, it's boring. Um, so changing the structure may be something you have to think about doing. And I think also letting the kids know that, hey, this is something we have to do together here. We gotta figure out how to navigate through this COVID era together. And we all have to contribute in some ways. Um, when we look at parent leadership, from our point of view, and I don't know if you guys can see all the three points of the triangle here, it's, it's for us, we try to keep it simple. It's 
safety, nurture, and challenge. These are the three key functions we believe all parents have with our kids. Um, it's easy when they're little, when they're two, we can keep them safe by putting the guardrails up. But man, when they're 16 and you wanna take the car out, um, keeping them safe gets to be a little more challenging. Um, we can talk a little more about that. Nurture, nurture is our ability to attune and understand them so that they feel like we get them. Um, it's easy to nurture our kids when they fall down and scrape their knee and give them a kiss and give them a hug and they can put a Band-Aid on and then they're off and running. One of the more uh, difficult parts of parenting is challenge. If we don't challenge our kids, it's likely that they will stay stuck. So one of the greatest uh, pre-COVID is the nurture challenge balance for parents. COVID has certainly added a whole nother layer of safety because we have to look out for others. So safety, what does that look like? Um, I would argue that parent involvement is not a punishment. It's our job to help them um, and lead them um, by keeping the guardrails up that are appropriate for them. Um, it's important that as adults or parents are aligned uh, uh, together family or divorce or separated family, their alignment between leadership is key so that you're able to implement interventions along those lines. It's always a challenge. When do we step in? You know, um, uh, my kids uh, uh, wanted to do a sleepover, right? And hey, it's okay. It's just two families. They're savvy, right? They understand some of the parameters. And this is where we stepped in and said, no, that's not okay for us right now. And we had to talk about that we have some, uh, my in-laws are older and have vulnerabilities and we want to be able to find ways to have social distance with them and doing a sleepover we felt put at greater risk. That was a time when we stepped in. Mm -hmm. I talked about earlier, they wanted to go see friends, west of Hutchinson, it's not safe. Um, so COVID has required a whole nother layer of safety. Um, a number of families have come in trying to struggle. What are the lines here? What's okay and what's not um, around safety. So this is a key one um, that's created a greater emphasis because of, of COVID. So this other piece of the triangle is about nurture. And really we talk about that parental attunement. We brought that up a little earlier in the presentation too. So how, what do we do to attune? It's really about active listening, being able to empathize limiting the advice giving. In those moments, it's really just about understanding what your kid's perspective is and holding that in the moment, really getting yourself to understand how they're experiencing their world, their emotions in that time, being able to ask for what they need um, and, and be able to listen to kids and what they're saying, what they think they need. Um, our language with our kids matters. Being able to validate their experience is really important. And I think what the great part about being able to validate somebody's experience is you don't necessarily have to agree with what their perspective is or even really like it. It is still their perspective. And so we get to validate that that is how they're viewing this their, themselves, their situation, their world right now. Um, you know, our, our kids are frustrated that they can't go spend time with friends and go have a sleepover. We get to validate that feeling of frustration. It is really frustrating. It is really heartbreaking that we're not able to do these things that mean a lot to us. We get to tune into those emotions and really make sure that our kids know that we're understanding that. It's important that parents are, you know, watching your body language, your verbal language, um, you know, pre-COVID, uh, you know, we're negotiating a plan time to discuss important matters. You know, sometimes we're, we're locked into the house now. Pre-COVID, we, ha we had to go to work. We had to go to school. Sometimes it was busy and chaotic. And I'd argue even now, even though we're all in under the same roof together, it's still important to be able to plan specific times. Um, I'm sure you've experienced, sometimes your kids don't wanna talk about what they're feeling right away in the moment. And, and that's okay. I think it's okay to give them that space, but make sure that you're following up with them. You know, okay, I, I can give you a little bit of space. I can see that you're having a hard time right now. I, I wanna be able to check in with you though, before we go to bed. 
So I'm, I'm just gonna check in with you around eight o'clock tonight, just to make sure um, that you and I are on the same page together. Being able to follow through on that is really important for our kids to see too. Our parents uh, are taking the time to understand and really attune to what I'm needing too. Um, so with that, that COVID and just change in general, especially this year, has really required uh, us as parents to have greater attunement for our kids. I would just echo uh, keeping an eye on how our kids are doing with school. Are they able to stay caught up? Are they able to participate? Um, sometimes that can be a barometer of, of stress. So um, it means we have to keep an eye on what's happening for them um, with school and staying in dialogue. So it's not always that you have to be by yourself with the attunement, you can have others watching as well. Um, attunement from neighbors, like if our kids have a peer group and if the other adults, I sometimes will ask, hey, how are the boys doing? What are you seeing? Mm -hmm. um, and if you have that kind of connection in, in, with a peer group or parents, that can be a real big asset mm -hmm. with this attunement piece. Yeah. Takes sometimes, a yeah, sometimes our kids don't want us to know how they're doing. Mm -hmm. makes it more, ch more challenging. Challenge. So I want to take a little bit about this. This is this is a hard one. So what does challenge look like? Um, challenge looks like uh, here are the rules, right? Here's the, here's the guidelines that we're setting up with our family. Um, and we're challenging you because we want you to feel like you're part of the family and you have to contribute. So that's a challenge and I'm, I'm pulling on a family value. In our family, the boys have to take the dishes out of the dishwasher. Some days they don't like it or they forget, um, but that's part of the, the values that we have for them. Um, challenging also with this uh, can get them to look at um, some different things. Um, uh, one of the areas of challenge that you may find easy to use is about mastery. When we get into difficulty with technology, tech time, um, one of the challenges to, to my kids, and, and you may find it valuable, is I need you to learn how to, to manage and balance screen time and the real. And I'll even go a little further. I'll say, you know, it's not fair because I didn't have to do this as a kid, but you do. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to help you with that. And if you need my help by shutting off the power to your computer at eight o'clock when tech time is done, if you need my help, I'm happy to come and do that for you because I think I'm helping you with mastery. I'm helping you to learn how to do that for yourself. And my kids will know at 8.05 when I come down and I say, hey, how are you guys doing? Do you need some help? Dad, I got it. Okay. And um, so again, it's about uh, helping them see that I want them to learn how to do this for themselves. Challenge can also be in the form of if we have a, a son or daughter that is struggling with mental health that may be part of it as well. I know that we're struggling with this and this is something we have to work together on. It's our challenge to work together to overcome this obstacle. Mm -hmm. Or I want you to work on understanding your feelings. I want you to work with someone so that you can figure this out for you. So these can be ways of, of putting it, uh, challenges out to our kids. growth. Man, has 2020 been a year of kind of forced and unforced growth for us all. Growth is really uncomfortable. And we know that nothing changes if nothing changes. So how do we live in the discomfort with our kids? You know, our kids aren't alone in this. And it's important for them to see that, you know, we, all of us in the world experience things like fear and anxiety and doubt. And we have this opportunity to lead our families and lead our kids through this by nurturing and challenging them through the discomfort to normalize what it feels like to feel a little uncomfortable and how to make some of those changes. Being able to join together as a family with our kids, I, I think is one of the greatest gifts that we're able to give to them. So we can do that by role modeling. We get to teach our children how to be human beings. And part of being a human being is all of the up and down and all around kind of thing that comes with life. Granted, I don't think any of us expected 2020 to be like it did, but we have the opportunity to teach our kids how to interact and react to the changes that come with us. Um, we need to be humble with them. 
We have to show them how to own our own mistakes when we're frustrated and irritated and irritable. And if we make a slip up, we, we yell or say something that we regret later, we have the opportunity to own our mistakes, to be able to ask for forgiveness and show them how to manage our own emotions. We have this opportunity to role model how to really do that for them and with them. We also get a role model how to activate our faith. When we're challenged in our faith and our beliefs, especially after this year that's been so trying, we get to show our kids how we're going to lean into that, to show them how we're using prayer, how we're leaning on our faith to give us that guidance and that comfort. Um, I think it's, it's what, another piece to, to really bring up is that it's important for you guys to access your faith communities. You have a, a fantastic community who is supportive and willing to really be in it with you guys too, that you guys are not alone in this at all. Um, so it's, it's an awesome invitation and opportunity for you guys to lean into that access as well. Um, I was thinking about this, Callie, and it made me smile um, in a humble way because um, there are times that uh, I have had a bad day and uh, there have been times that I have sworn in my house and um, my kids would tell their mom. Damn, oh. um, but the, the part for me is that coming back around and say to them, you guys, I, I need to apologize to you. I wasn't my best self. Mm -hmm. I, I swore and that's not how I want to be. So I need to tell you guys, I apologize, I, I will do better, right? And, and I think that's the kind of stuff that's helpful um, mm -hmm. for our kids to hear. And there are times where it's like, I, I don't have an answer. I don't know the answer to this. Or um, I know what, what we're gonna do today. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you what tomorrow's gonna bring, but here's how we're gonna do this today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a statement to have to make in, in the past year that we've had with all of the unknowns of the pandemic and, you know, political chaos that we've all experienced that, you know, a lot of times I, I can tell you today and, and we'll be in it together for tomorrow too. Um, it's important that you have parental alignment. You're the hub of your family system. You're the leaders. And there's going to be differences of parenting style, personality values. Um, I can't tell you the number of families that I've had where spouses or partners had different political views and mm -hmm. the tension or struggle that they had was, was uh, difficult for many of them this year. Um, many of them, most of them were able to work their way through it um, because they were able to take time to align and make sure that they are clear how they're going to have a, kind of a kindness and nurturing with each other. Um, it's important to know that there can be pitfalls. And, and take time to monitor and maintenance this um, and clarify how you're gonna safety, use safety and nurture and challenge um, with, with each other. Um, we all have bad days. So uh, it's important that, that we have that humility as we go. Mm -hmm. uh, life, life happens. Sometimes parents aren't aligned in decisions and, and that's okay. Um, I think it's really critical to be able to take that reset, to pause, and, and to be able to verbalize it with your kids too. Hey, mom and dad have to have some things that we need to work out together first, and we'll let you know. We're not really sure how we're going to handle this situation right now, but mom and dad are going to work together, and we're going to figure out a good solution that's really fitting for our family. I think it, that's one more example of being able to role model how to make those decisions together and, and creates a sense of safety for our kids too, that they know their parents are working together and are going to lead them through some of these difficult times together too. I think Michael and I would just encourage to get help if you need it. If you and your co-parent are really struggling with how to find that alignment to to reach out for, for resources from your faith community, from a mental health community, to not stay stuck for very long in that. So we need to help our kids manage relationships. COVID has amplified the life task of balancing the real and the virtual. I think Michael and I really saw this already being a challenging new life task for kids pre-COVID. It's really hard for kids to balance how much time I'm using on my technology, my video games, social media, 
and being in, in the real, in my real relationships. And with COVID, I mean, most of us are working electronically, our kids are logging into school. It's really hard to have that on and off switch in that balancing of the real and the virtual. Um, so they, they look to parents, they're looking for you guys to be able to help them set that structure and that leadership. What is that healthy technology use with school and social contact? In some ways it might look, it probably has looked very different than it has pre-COVID. Our kids really thrive and need social contact. They also need to be logging into school and being able to have some kind of social communication with their friends is really important. Um, I know for me and, and, and my clients, I've seen kids really thrive with Zoom learning and some kids who have really struggled with Zoom learning. I think more in the latter piece of it. It's important to be able to uh, understand and attune to each of your kids' needs and how to balance that technology and the real for them. And also how parents are role modeling this balance too. To be able to check in with yourselves. How are you balancing the technology use? How are you balancing how to be present in the real? Because our kids are looking to us and how to balance that too. If we're setting up rules and guidelines and structures, and then we're having a hard time following it too, the kids are gonna have a lot of confusion on how they're supposed to manage their own stuff too. So it's an, it's an awesome opportunity for us to really be in it with our kids too. I say, yeah, it is really hard. I, I really want to go and just sit on Facebook for a little bit and kind of mindlessly scroll for a while. And I know that that might not be the healthiest option for me right now. So I get it. It is really hard. What should we do together to manage that? We want to take a little bit of time to talk about when to seek help. Um, the, the fourth bullet down there, the parent intuition, that, that to me is a really powerful one. Um, because as parents, you pick up things, you pick up, there's something not right, there's something not going well, and you may not know exactly what it is, but what I believe that is, is that, that parents by nature, I believe, are attuned to our kids, and you can pick up on the nonverbal things that might be happening, um, and so listen to that. If there's a parent intuition, um, talk to your, your, your spouse or partner. Um, about, you know, what are you seeing? Here's what I'm seeing. Um, um, be aware of child distress. When children are overwhelmed, you may see that they're shutting down or disappearing. Um, it's important to be able to assess that. And if you're not sure, um, make sure that, that you're taking steps to, to get them support if they need it. Um, threat of self-harm, we talked a little bit about that. I really wanna emphasize this. This is, um, you, you can see this with kids directly stating it. Sometimes you may find that a child will share something with a friend who tells their parent who then tells you, okay? So that can happen. Um, take it very seriously. Um, if you want to uh, easily take steps, um, I'll move to our next slide. But it, it's, it's about seeking medical help with immediacy. Our pediatricians are great here in Minnesota. They're very good at helping um, to take a look at that. Be aware of relational conflict. That relational conflict, when we're seeing that happen, may be an indicator of somebody struggling with mental health. Um, and, and they're staying in the conflict and, and are agitated. So that's typically, to me, a sign of depression or anxiety. Um, where to seek help? Um, pediatricians are a great one. If you need help fast, you call your pediatrician. I think I have a medical, a mental health crisis. They, they have to respond and will either have you come in immediately or refer you to the ER. Um, we have wonderful staff uh, at schools. School counselors are available for, for getting some help um, so you can reach out to them. Religious counsel, my goodness, a faith community is a blessing because you can call and say, hey, I, I think I got this. What do you, who do you know or what do you think would be the best step? Um, a trusted confidant, um, to, to help steer you in the right direction. Um, certainly a therapist um, can be a great asset. Um, first off, just to be able to assess what's going on and, uh, uh, and then give you some ideas of how to help. The family piece can be really valuable um, when you have uh, 
uh, a relational conflict, particularly with adolescent boys, um, that individual versus family therapy can be a, a, a struggle because if you're a young man, uh, young women too, I, if I go to therapy, that means there's something wrong with me. I don't want to have something wrong with me. There's a shame in that. However, if you take a strategy of saying, dude, I, this doesn't feel good. Something's happening for us and you're really important to me. And I know I might have to make some changes, but let's go together and try to figure out how to make this relationship work a little better. Now that's an easier way to ease into something than, than dude, I think you gotta figure some stuff out. Um, so it, um, when you're finding a professional, make sure it's a good fit, you know, um, we're writing an article about this, about how to, how to assess. We really recommend that you call and talk to the therapist ahead of time when you're looking for a provider for your son or daughter. It's important that you feel <clears throat> as though they are gonna be able to understand and work with your son or daughter. It's important that you feel as though they're gonna continue to keep you involved. As a parent, you have to know what's going on in the therapy office so you know how to support it. So we are big advocates of, of individual therapy and direct contact the parents so parents know what's going on and, and what we're working on. Um, you have to believe that it's life-giving for your family to take the step. So vet it, um, um, it's important. You want a good fit. Um, it's hard when you have a misfire on the first go around and have to, re have to find a new one. So I encourage you to, 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 to do your due diligence um, and call and connect. So we got some references here. Um, happy to, to share the, the slides with anybody that wants them. We'll, we'll make sure they, they get that out there. Um, and you know, we have three yeah. more parts that we're doing here that we're excited about. Yeah, so this is our part one of our four part series. Um, so we'll, we'll be with you guys the next three Wednesdays uh, if you want to join us. Next week we'll be talking about grief, loss, and family resilience during COVID. Following the week, what if your kid says no? We provide you guys with practical tips of managing that resistance and defiance, especially during COVID times. And then wrapping it up, um, help our technology is taking control. Um, and that will be that final week. I think Michael is adding that last little piece as we got, got started here. Sorry, that was cut off you guys. That final one would be February 17th, um, so. The, the, what we're thinking and what we're worried about is that when our kids um, enter back into the real more with the school, there's gonna be this massive withdrawal from, from technology that may be very difficult for our kids. And so part of that fourth one is really trying to help parents be prepared to know how to lead our kids through that transition that, that likely will be happening, um, hopefully by next fall. But if you know more uh, ahead of time, we can help you be prepared. So um, this is who we are. We're over in, uh, well, technically it's Plymouth, but it's uh, off of 369 and uh, 390, or 169 and 394. Yeah. Right off Schlard Parkway is where we're located. Um, mm -hmm is to have a deep commitment to working with families. Um, so um, we have, a, we've kind of hit the, the limit of time, but we do have a few extra moments. If there's any questions, if anybody would care to put in the chat, we can take a few minutes here to answer if anybody has it. Um, otherwise, we're just grateful to be with you and, and uh, um, happy to, to see you all next time when you come in uh, and invite your friends or family if you think it'd be valuable for them. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to um, thank you, uh, Michael and Callie, just not only just for normalizing uh, what many parents are probably struggling with, but just giving this space. And even if you don't have questions now, you may just go, you know, go throughout your night and say, you know what, I really wish I would have um, uh, asked this or, or heard about this. And I uh, please reach out to me, um, Sherry, and I will 
get your questions and I will ask Callie and Michael and maybe what we can do is either I can follow up with you or they can follow up with you if that's okay. Or we can just kind of touch on them next week. Just, I, it's really important that you have the opportunity to get out of this program what you need or questions because we are here to really just walk this journey and it, it is a very hard time. And um, you are just, again, ones I wanna say is you are not alone. So please just know that. I really appreciate that. Um, the, the invitation absolutely is out there of um, be able to ask questions. Um, if, if you guys are interested in having um, kind of a, a complimentary 15 minute conversation of inquiring about therapy services too, um, Michael and I and, and our other provider, Matt, can be available to, to really talk about and, and really hear and understand what you guys are, are experiencing as a family too. I want to just do a quick response. There's some questions about tech time or how to manage that. Certainly that fourth uh, uh, workshop will go more depth on that. I, I would encourage you to think about challenging our kids on, on reducing tech time or screen time. So the first part is the challenge. Why do you want them to reduce the technology time? And, and so you have to help them understand with a compelling reason. Now they may not like it or agree with it, but you have to start with a rationale. Mm -hmm. like I, I did not like it when my dad would say, why do I have to do this? Because I said so. Mm -hmm. like, ah, well, yeah. Yeah, uh, but if I had a compelling reason, I want you to have a healthy balance of time on screen and being in the real. Mm -hmm. And I want you to practice not being on the computer. I want you to find a book to read or to do something different. So, so that's the, 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 the challenge. Most kids will respond to that, but we have to help them um, understand why it's important. And then if they can't do it, that's where you get to start, decide what's the new structure I need to put in. Do I need to find a tool or an app that I can limit screen access? You can, again, uh, sometimes we have to do that with the kids, so. Good questions. Uh, that fourth one will be an important one if folks want to dig a little deeper on more specific strategies around that. All right, you guys. It was a pleasure to be with everybody. Thank you. Uh, really an honor to be with you guys tonight. Be well. Have uh, um, have a good and, and safe uh, week until hopefully see many of you next week.